fact, and I mean, that's but, but let's say that's the same thing. Yeah, I mean, say they're smoking the same thing, and we've got Jerry Garcia over here, and, and uh, you know, uh, we've Mr. Smith, and Mr. Smith just takes a little tiny puff, and Jerry Garcia takes a huge puff, and that the the THC content, and everything else, are going to be completely different, right? Yeah. Well, their dose will be different. So when we talk about lab studies, you know, with this marijuana stuff, it's not like alcohol where you and I can sit there and do a, and we will be drinking later on in this, in our, the next part of my cross-examination, but say we both take a shot of vodka, we're going to pretty much see the same type of effects. You know, we can control that sample going into our bodies. I guess I'm not, if what you're saying is the, the dose in marijuana differs from cigarette to cigarette, person to person, sure. Right, and in these studies, so we have these studies that you're relying on that really, you know, the studies are based on this complete uncertainty as to, you know, how much marijuana is going into your body. Um, no, not really. I mean, what they are measuring in these studies is a, is a THC and the carboxy THC levels in your blood. So how many puffs it takes this person versus that person to get there, I don't know. But once you're looking at the levels in the blood, which are determined by GCMS the way we do, you can look at the decline. You can see how long that takes. That's a little bit different than measuring how many cigarettes it takes you to get to a certain level in your blood to start with. So let's, let's continue here with our little... The graph, the THC is going down, the carboxy THC is coming up. Um, isn't it true that there's uh, uh, literature out there, and, and a lot of literature, that indicates that the, the THC can stay in your system for at least a couple of hours, right? Yes. Okay, it could be, what, what do you think? What do you think the maximum is that you've seen in, in literature? The maximum amount of time? Time that THC can be in your blood. In your blood, at what level? I have never at any level. Oh, at any level? I mean, it's probably at picogram levels in um, your, your and by that I mean like two or three orders of magnitude below what our lab would detect is probably there in your chronic users as, for as long as it shows up in the urine, but it's not going to be detectable by our at, our, at that level by our instrumentation. So at the level that we can detect it and would report it out, um, I wouldn't expect it to be there past 18 hours, maybe 20 if they have So 18, 20 problem. hours for yeah. the regular THC? Yeah, for regular THC for, I'm not... I would not expect somebody to say I smoked that two days ago, and here it is in my blood today. I would not expect to see that. Okay. And so we, we have uh, this thing that could be in your blood, this THC, that could be in there for quite a long time. More than just, it's not like Mr. Smith and Jerry Garcia both smoke their marijuana cigarettes, and a half an hour later there's no THC in their system, right? Well, correct, because it's not just, yeah, it's in their blood, and again, it's also going to be sequestered in the tissue. So when people say in their system... Um, we have to be clear what we're talking about here because it probably is in some of your tissues for a long time after that. But it's not going to be in your blood and it's not going to be measurable by a laboratory when it, in your fat or your brain. Now, when the carboxy THC has come up, now does that do the same thing where the levels will go up and then peak and then go back down? They do, but the level, but it's a much lower plateau and it takes longer. So your carboxy THC levels are going to plateau at a lower level than your um, generally your THC peak is. And we don't usually in our cases see the peak because the peak's usually long gone by the time the blood is drawn and it gets to us. So typically we would see a, a low THC and a much higher carboxy THC. But in the lab studies it'll stay at whatever it plateaus at for several hours. Now most of these studies, like the study's over in 12 hours, so how long, you know, but by then it's come back down again almost to baseline. Well, let's talk about the Houston study. She's done several studies. Let's talk about the one where she attempted to, and you testified about retrograde extrapolation of alcohol. Didn't she try to see if she could do that with uh, marijuana? She did try to do that with marijuana. She came up with two models that you, if you, and you need the THC to do this, uh, THC and the carboxy THC. And she came up with two, two formulas and, and said you can use this formula, that formula. Um, it's not real widely used. I don't know anybody that uses that. I suspect that it doesn't work as well in the real world as it did in the lab studies. I've not used it. So when I rely on her studies, I'm really looking at when she has these people smoking marijuana and she looks at how long this stuff stays in her system, what is the outside of which she doesn't see it anymore? I'm not using her models to calculate any levels or any times. And with her models that she used, she looked for... She had, I think, two separate tables, right? She or two separate types of experiments. She had the one where it was the THC. Here's the marijuana cigarette, and they smoked a couple of these cigarettes. And then she tested for THC, and she tried to see if there's a correlation between the THC and the time, right? Um, she's done. That's <clears throat> well, just and you're you're familiar with what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, that, that one study she tried to calculate come up with a formula you could do a retrograde for, but because it's not linear, it's it's very variable. And she also had. 
um, limits of confidence and 95% in, in and in, it was it was a lot more complicated than alcohol and it isn't it's not widely used. I don't know anybody that uses it in court. And that's and I learned about this over the weekend. Now my uh, lovely wife is getting her PhD uh, over there at the state, so she explained this to me. I I had a bad enough time in science in college, and I really had a tough time looking at these articles and reading. But one of the things that kept on coming up was the is it the confidence interval? Yes. And in that particular study, the confidence interval was not ninety five percent, right? Well, she had more than one confidence interval. She had the 99% confidence interval and the 95% confidence interval. So how she did it was, while well, you use this formula, you can have a 99% certainty that the time that she's looking for the time was, was this many hours ago. And if you use this formula, you have a 95% certainty. But you needed both the, the presence of both the, the parent drug and the um, uh, carboxy THC. And again, these are short time frames we're talking about because the, the THC is gone within several hours. And so she, but she, when she was doing this though, she didn't say we're gonna just do carboxy THC though, right? She did THC, THC, and carboxy THC, and those were the two samples she was looking at, right? Yes. Okay. And so, and some of those, uh, the confidence interval was much lower to try to predict when somebody was smoking marijuana, right? Well, that's probably one of the reasons that people don't really use it. And she's not followed up with another study on that since then that I'm aware of. So it's pretty accepted in the scientific community that you can't really look at somebody's carboxy THC with any relative certainty. Go back and say, well, you know, uh, Jerry Garcia smoked two hours ago. Correct. Okay. Now, well, another thing about that study um, that I noticed, and we're we're looking at the THC in somebody's system, and it looked like in that study there were people that had pretty <clears throat> regular levels of THC hours after they had smoked, right? Um, which study? The, the one that we were just talking about. The, the <coughs> that study, she was using, I think, data from previous studies. That was just a calculation study. So oh, well, depending on what study she's done and how much they've had to smoke, um, yeah, you would see it for several hours afterwards. So you'll see somebody with, actually, I mean, there's been studies, and you've probably read, I'm sure you've read, where there, you'll have people that have regular, uh, a sizable amount of regular THC in their system hours after they've smoked, right? How many hours and what do you mean by sizable? Yeah, you can see it. I would not expect to see it more than about 12 hours after you smoked. She saw it 10 hours. Yeah, sure. Now, so at some point, the carboxy, we're going back here to the graph. I don't want to lose focus here, but we're going back to this carboxy THC plateau. Now, at some point, all the THC is gone, right? And now we just have carboxy THC, correct? In the blood. In the blood, yes. And I'm limiting it just to the blood. So yes. Now, and then the carboxy THC doesn't have a quick half-life like the THC does, though, right? Correct. That stays around much longer. Okay. So that carboxy THC in your blood can stay there for a pretty long time, right? Yes. Longer than the THC. Now, uh, uh, we heard that you said that 10 nanograms. What, what does this 10 nanograms mean? Is that a lot of carboxy THC or a little bit? A lot and a little or a relative amount. Um, again, I don't know exactly how much this person had to smoke with to start with. I can tell you that in our lab, the average in a driving case, if it's only marijuana that we're looking at, is around 30. So it's less than that. Um, so it would be two-thirds less than the average. Yes, okay. that's, now, the, that's the average for what that's worth. And our lab's numbers compare fairly well with other labs' numbers because there have been you know, people published. This is how many cases we've seen in crashes, and these are the levels of the drugs, and that's fairly comfortable. Now, do other uh, organizations, I know you work for the state lab, but like, say, for instance, the Department of Defense, do they have criteria for minimum levels of carboxy THC if they're doing drug tests? In urine, there are no levels in blood by the Department of Defense, by uh, NIDA, or by anybody else. Well, what's the, uh, the level in urine? Um, I believe it is, uh, well, the Department of Defense might be a little different. For workplace drug testing, I think it's 50 and confirmable at uh, 50 by amino acid and confirmable at 15. And for the Department of Defense, I think it's lower. I think it's 15 at 25 by amino acid. Okay, so uh, let's let's get back to this carboxy THC. Now, when the body is converting the THC through this uh, chemical process to the carboxy THC, other things are becoming metabolites as well, correct? Um, you mean there are other metabolites in carboxy THC? Well, I, I guess is a metabolite. And correct me if I'm wrong, because uh, I don't quite understand it. You know, uh, when when I say metabolite, that would be any byproduct of uh, the initial compound, correct? Yes. So if I said that 